Our oligarch of the hour is Bill Gates, college dropout, software pioneer, one of the five richest people, not just in the world, but in human history. Joining us now, Dana Kennedy, national writer for the New York Post, also with us uh, is history, media, and studies, and education lecturer, uh, Dr. Nolan Higdon. Uh, he's uh, the author of The Anatomy of Fake News, A Critical News Education. Uh, Dr. Higdon, I want to start with you. You're really becoming our expert here on American oligarchs. Uh, when I was doing research today, uh, the thing that really struck me was how much land Bill Gates is buying farmland, 270,000 acres so far in the United States. It's staggering. His latest purchase just recently was 2,000 acres in North Dakota, potato farming land. Apparently, the neighbors there are furious. They're upset that he's buying all of this land. What's going on behind the scenes? Why does Bill Gates want all of this farmland? Well, thank you for having me back on the program. I don't know if I can uh, get inside the head of Gates and, and say what he plans to do with the land, but I think the fact that he is uh, the largest owner of farmland illustrates um, you know, that it's not a baseless conspiracy or slippery slope to say that unless stopped, oligarchs will continue to accumulate as much wealth and resources as possible until theoretically there's nothing left for everybody else. Yeah, I think people think it's freaky. I mean, he's gobbling up land all over the country. In North Dakota, as I mentioned, they're not happy. Uh, even the government officials are getting involved saying, wait a minute, you can't keep buying land. Uh, Dana, we sort of have this obsession here with American oligarchs because they have all this power, but they don't want to give us information about them. That's why we're doing the series this week. Last two nights, we've... Uh, We've dived into Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos. Musk, we've been told, is approachable to his employees. Bezos has sort of a reputation of being a tyrant. Uh, what is it like to work for Bill Gates? What, what is his management style, Dana? From what we've really heard went back when he was uh, running Microsoft full time, he was also a bit of a tyrant in a very kind of the Steve Jobs type of way. He was very combative with any kind of underlings. He didn't even really want to talk to anybody but senior management. He would say things like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know, these guys don't get to the top by being like Mr. Rogers. You know, they're they're all kind of rough and they have a certain kind of you know, public image when they're being philanthropists. But, you know, you just you just can't get to the top by being a nice guy. But, you know, to, to your point about the farmland, I mean, on one hand, yeah, he's buying up all this farmland. He's got X-Files, Twilight Zone type of vibe to it. We don't know what he's doing there. What's next? Crop circles. But we're also, I'm working on a story about how he's just right. plunked down $170 million with uh, Saudi Arabia Prince um, Al-Walid uh, to buy the Palazzo Marini uh, in Rome, right next to the Spanish steps. And they're going to turn into a six-star hotel. And this is part of what Bill, we don't know Bill Gates that much, the commercial investor, but he has a top, top investor back in Seattle who pours money into all you know, hotels and things like that. He's basically the majority owner now of the Four Seasons. So he's got the philanthropy, but he's also got the commercial side and he's got the vaccine side. He was really leading the pandemic in many ways alongside Dr. Fauci, but his legs were kind of cut off with the whole Melinda French divorce and the slightly uh, disturbing Jeffrey Epstein relationship. So we're seeing a little bit less of him as sort of the, the global ambassador of the pandemic. Yeah, and let me point out, when he gobbles up all this land, it's not like it says Bill Gates on the deed. He, he does it under these shell companies, and oftentimes it's very, very hard to sort out and figure out that he's actually the guy in the background. Uh, Dr. Higdon, let's talk about the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the biggest, if not one of the biggest charities in the world. Obviously, it sounds like they do good work. Um, but is there another side to this? I mean, is, is this just another power play, or are they really actually trying to do good? Well, you know, again, if this is a series on oligarchs, I mean, there's a long history of oligarchs in U.S. history who uh, try to operate under the veneer of philanthropy to, to conceal their rapacious greed. And I think um, the uh, Gates Foundation is in that tradition. I mean, let's not forget the foundation was largely created as a PR stunt to distract from um, his rapacious business models, which uh, were, were being exposed during an antitrust trial in, in the late 1990s. Um, so I think that, yes, they do, they do give money to uh, causes that I think a lot of people would, would advocate for. But, but the reality is a lot of that money goes to policy papers and lobbying um, and ways of him ingratiating himself and influencing um, lawmakers. And so the, the proof really needs to be in the outcome. What are the outcomes of this funding? And really what the outcome looks like is it's just a way for Gates to expand his influence and to improve his public image. 
Interesting. Dana, let's let's talk about the divorce. You brought it up a little while ago, the divorce with Melinda. Um, does Jeffrey Epstein really play a part in this? I thought the interview that Melinda Gates did with, with Gail King on CBS was so telling. I mean, I wasn't expecting that when, when, when she used those words to describe uh, Bill's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein and basically said, if you want to know more, ask Bill. Do you think that was really um, part, part of the reason they got divorced? What was going on behind the scenes? Well, I think Melinda French is pretty shrewd, and she knew what to say to get the public on her side. I mean, she cut his legs off in that interview. I wouldn't want to be him. She did. So oh, she did. Yeah. Who knows, who knows if that... I mean, I'm assuming that the affairs at Microsoft were not really... Uh, she wasn't too fond of those either. You know, so, so, you know, Bill has many facets, I think is all we can really say. And who knows what his ne next facet will be. Dr. Higdon, it's fascinating. You have wrote and, uh, written about uh, what you call, quote, a second gilded age highlighted by vast wealth inequality, hyper-partisanship, and a new crop of oligarchs purchasing media and political influence. Uh, this certainly applies when you think about Elon Musk and, and the Twitter purchase, uh, Jeff Bezos owning uh, the Washington Post. How does Bill Gates fit into that equation? Uh just like um, uh, Bezos and, and Musk, Gates has used his wealth to influence governance. Um, he, you know, directly and indirectly donates the super PACs, um, the Clinton Foundation, um, the Gates Foundation creates policy papers and studies that lawmakers then use to devise policy. Um, as I mentioned before, he uh, spends a lot of money on, on lobbying as well. And that influential power allows him to shape policy and, and public perception. Um, to the point where, you know, he's been able to position himself as a expert or intellectual voice on critical issues like pandemics and vaccines and climate change and democracy, even though there's really no evidence to, to confirm that he's done any research or work to deserve uh, that, that position. Um, but his wealth buys him that. It, it buys that influence. It buys his way into all of our policy discussions. Yeah, Dr. Higdon, it's, it's like w with guys like Bill Gates, they're just supposed to know about everything. They can be the expert on everything and tell us what to think. And we're just supposed to believe them because they're so rich. I mean, it, it doesn't seem to make any sense. Yeah, it's something very um, corrosive about the culture. Uh, you know, we, we conflate wealth with, with intellect or, or value as if you're wealthy, you somehow uh, need to be the person we need to turn to to lead the society. And I think Gates is, is emblematic of that. He's rich. He took advantage of, you know, government research and um, weak government uh, policies to stop monopolies. Um, but that's about the extent of how deep Gates goes. And a lot of these other issues, I don't think he necessarily uh, has any more of a voice than it, or should have any more of a voice than anybody else. Yeah, just fascinating. Dr. Nolan Higdon, Dana Kennedy, uh, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate the conversation. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.